Can you imagine a world where you could get a meal for one dollar or less? No, right? Well, that's exactly what happened in the golden days of the 70s. Let's go through some of the best foods people regularly enjoyed for just a single dollar. You need a sandwich every now and then. That is a given fact of life, and one of the best ways to have one is to keep it simple with a BLT sandwich. After all, there really is no bigger turnoff than a sandwich that keeps falling apart because it just has too much going on. One of the nicest BLTs you could get back in Massachusetts in the 1970s was the one at the Colonial Inn. Now, the inn itself was something of a historical landmark, having been built all the way back in the 1700s, which makes it way older than some countries even. That does not mean the inn itself was old-fashioned, though it definitely had a dated air to it. A lot of the stuff on the menu that they served kept in line with the tastes of the era, and their BLT sandwich had the crispiest strips of bacon with fresh tomatoes and a killer mayo unique to them. For just about a dollar, this was a steal of a meal, and you really could not beat that price. Next up, we have the Big Mac meal from McDonald's, which all of you must be way too well acquainted with by now. Most of today's America has been pretty much raised on their menu. Anyway, the Big Mac bag of the 70s was a different sight and experience than the one you have now. Today, we have to pay more than $5 for two exhausted-looking patties, but back then, they were really trying to hype this up as a new mainstay in their line. A Big Mac sandwich cost about 65 to 75 cents, and with the fries and drink combo, it came to around one or one dollar and five cents. The sauce back then was a variation of the Thousand Island dressing they use today, and the sandwich itself had more generous portions of meat. All in all, it was really hard for other places to keep up with the value. Taking a small interruption from the sandwich show to talk a little bit about the famous go-to meal of the 70s in coastal areas, the classic lobster roll. Things were a lot different just 50-odd years ago than they are now, even as far as worldwide norms go. See, nowadays, wherever you are, it is a given that lobster is going to cost you, and pretty deeply at that. Depending on the quality, size, freshness, season, and demand, you could be looking at tens to hundreds of dollars. Even meals like lobster rolls fall under that, but back then, in coastal places, it was common to get one for anywhere between $1 to $3. If you were having it from a restaurant slightly on the fancier side or in a lush neighborhood, then, yeah, it would not be a dollar. In most areas of coastal cities, it was still $1 and pretty affordable, meaning that it caught on real quick with the people. A lot of common meals were pretty different back then, actually. Even something as plain and ordinary as a pizza slice. They do not cost a dollar now, but back then, even in the streets of New York, you could catch a wonderful thin crust slice without worrying about the price. How do you think the city became so famous for its pizza? While New York is known for its thin crust, back then it was just as popular for its deep dish offerings. It would typically have pepperoni, a very tangy tomato sauce, and less mozzarella cheese than we are used to today. The shining traits of this meal were its accessibility, flavor, and the comfort factor, and that is why it began to define the fast food experience in America. Hershey's Bars became the premium brand it is today because it really kept a standard in all levels of the product. The packaging was this silver foil with a sleeve that had the logo of the company on it, which really made it feel special. It was simple but memorable enough that it stuck in people's heads, and the texture was the smoothest it ever was back then. Most bars were also 1.55 ounces, but you could get one for 25 cents back then, or less. Sometimes kids could even get away with six bars for just a dollar, which is a pretty good haul. The bars became known for the DIY recipes that many home chefs started as well, which often made great use of the bars. Stuff like s'mores were never complete without some Hershey's bars, and it was pretty inexpensive to keep a stock. If you felt more like a seafood person back in those years, then we are sure you can remember all the options that were available. One in particular did much better than others, and that was the $1 New England Clam Chowder Bowl. Why the association with the state? That is because the place became known for having cheap yet amazing and honest chowder. There was no fancy stuff going on, no special sauce, no secret ingredient. It was just plain good old chowder done right and proper. For just under a dollar, you could have clams in a creamy chowder with potatoes and bacon mixed in. There was not much seasoning since the dish was flavorful enough on its own, 
and you got it in this very cozy-looking plain bowl alongside oyster crackers. Sometimes a diner or sea shack or two would even serve a bread bowl with it just for a dollar. You could get a Salisbury steak with gravy, meatloaf, or fried chicken, served with mashed potatoes and rice. You could choose between peas, broccoli, or other vegetables. It was all the convenience a foodie could ask for at a price that seemed as if it came right out of a dream. These were the typical frozen TV dinners of the 1970s, which you could get for just a measly dollar. It was available at almost any local store and came in aluminum trays that could be microwaved or placed in the oven. Now, for a dollar, it had variety and nutrition going on, but the taste was exactly what you would expect. It was not anything too special, but what made it really go wild in sales was that it came right around the time TV culture started popping off. People loved watching while eating, and the demand for meals like this grew. If you were a kid back then, you must remember Kellogg's cereals. The variety of choices was enough to send any kid into a dopamine-induced frenzy. Some of the brand's biggest hits were Rice Krispies, Frosted Flakes, Special K, and Fruit Loops. Most kids typically grew up on loops or cornflakes, but any could really work as a meal that would keep your child sitting at the table happily. Frosted Flakes were known for being sugary and having a thick coating, but Rice Krispies were light. They had a whole spectrum of flavors going on and had enough solid products in their roster to keep it lively too, so people enjoyed Kellogg's for a good long while. Makes sense how the company is still a titan in the cereal industry today, even if you cannot get the same delicious cereal for a dollar anymore. Must have been great to grow up back when your paycheck actually meant something, right? Next, we have Spam and Eggs, which has a bit of a question mark hanging over it if you look at it from the taste palette of a 2024 American. Put yourself in their shoes, though. You need a practical breakfast option every day and something that has some serious shelf life. Preferably, the more affordable, the better, and it needs to work with things like bread and eggs. Spam was the perfect option that landed right in the center of the market as it grew in popularity, which definitely peaked in the 70s. A Spam and Eggs breakfast was a common option for people of all walks of life, bodybuilders, casual gym goers, people just trying to make their shift, and students. In states like Hawaii, it was particularly popular, but in all places over America, it was very affordable as a complete breakfast for just one one dollars. The 70s did not just see an interest growing in Hawaiian cuisine. They also wanted to dip their fingers into some Southern and Cajun-style recipes that had been creeping up in popularity recently. Stuff like shrimp remoulade had somewhat of a renaissance in the era, as it was suddenly one of the most commonly eaten meals. States like Louisiana would have poached shrimp that had a tangy remoulade sauce, which used a wide range of spices. In the South and Gulf Coast as well, it started to become a staple in crawfish boils and many popular seafood joints over the regions. Frozen shrimp was also rising and making a name for itself, and so people found ways to do it at home as well. Considering how affordable it was, it's no wonder the dish became so well-loved and widespread. Falafel has not always been the healthy lunch option we know it as today. It was also a great meal you could get on the street for an unbeatable price. They always made them extra crispy, too, and we all know how good street-side stalls are at deep frying. The herbs and spices were a lot stronger than the ones we are used to today, and tahini sauce was particularly popular. While it was initially only popular in neighborhoods with a Middle Eastern or Turkish community, it started gaining a big name for itself as a protein-heavy meal you could have almost anywhere, and it filled you up too. American palates in the 1970s in general started to take more of an interest in foreign cuisines, and the falafel sandwich was an example of it. If we take a bit of a stroll towards the fine dining side of things, we will find an array of Cornish game hens on silver platters being served up to the gentry and occasional family on a night out. It was also something that home chefs became somewhat infatuated with amidst all of the attention chicken was getting. For people that wanted to change it up, they absolutely adored the prospect of game hens. By the middle of the 1970s, they were in enough demand that most grocery outlets and meat establishments began to keep a steady supply of hens. The interest in them started mostly because of celebrity chefs and various cooking shows that featured delightful recipes involving Cornish game hens. 
Plus, it does not help matters when you consider that the 70s was a very creativity-oriented and experimentative phase of America's cultural history. A while back when we were discussing falafels, we mentioned how they were a side effect of a growing national interest in the unknown delicacies that were past their own borders. You can only have so many quarter pounders and meatloaves before your mind starts to wander. Another good demonstration of that interest is the French showstopper, escargot. It wouldn't be accurate to say that Americans and French cuisine have always been intertwined, as Americans have turned it into something of a status symbol. However, more understated elements of French cuisine like escargot only gained popularity in the 70s thanks to shows like those hosted by Julia Child, which helped bring lesser-known French dishes to the forefront. There was also a huge inclination in the people's hearts towards gourmet dining, and this was the perfect meal for a fancy getaway and a night out on the town. Despite its status as an upscale item on the menu, there were some places that did casual escargots too, and you could find those for a dollar. Not everyone could afford satisfying a craving for French food constantly, but places like that existed exactly because of financial limits. This one will really take your belief in us for a spin because we suspect it is going to be pretty hard to believe that you could find a whole chuck roast for just a dollar. Except, if you do a little bit of searching or ask someone from the decade, then they will agree and fondly reminisce about better times. A chuck roast is the shoulder cut of the cow, meaning it's a tougher cut of meat you can sink your teeth into rather than the melt-in-your-mouth tenderness of other cuts. While that kind of treatment for a prime cut was also great, people liked to switch it up. Still, though, it was too tough to eat as it was, so people would typically braise it in slow cooking. Getting this for such a cheap price meant that pot roasts were always almost a daily option for families. We have had a lot of savory delights in the list so far, but not much going for us in the sweet tooth section, so let's change that up, shall we? A perfect place to start, actually, are Baked Alaska which were popular in most areas besides their namesake state. Usually, if you got this, you were looking at a pound cake that had been coated with a nice thick meringue that was baked to give it a crunchy exterior. There was an ice cream topping that would stay frozen inside, and bakeries and restaurants sold slices of this for a dollar usually. Of course, you would not get an entire cake for that price, but if you wanted to have a few slices to get the blood sugar in your brain working again, or to get a nice hit of happiness, this was the way to go in the 1970s. A dollar shrimp cocktail in Nevada was a side character in the larger scheme of things, but any great film has a solid supporting cast. As far as that context goes, shrimp cocktails were one of the best choices to go for. Since they were so cheap too, they drove the profits of many bars and restaurants for a good while in the 1970s. Even in places like Las Vegas, a shrimp cocktail would usually run the restaurant a hefty profit, surprisingly at such competitive prices too. Steamed or boiled shrimp were served chilled in a glass or bowl, accompanied by a tangy cocktail sauce made from ketchup, Worcestershire sauce, and lemon juice, making this a very tempting option. You could also find it at a lot of casino buffets and cocktail lounges, which Vegas itself was filled with. As a result, this got associated with the dining culture that was present in most gambling establishments. Going back to the sweeter side of things, we have an absolute all-time favorite of the masses, a banana split sundae. You go to an ice cream parlor today and they kind of take the extreme euphoria factor out of the experience with the ridiculous prices they charge now, but back in the 70s this, just like with everything else so far, was not the case. A traditional split had half a banana sliced with three scoops of vanilla or chocolate ice cream, though there were many flavors you could pick from besides that. Then you had your choice of drizzling. You could pick from chocolate syrup or strawberry sauce. It would finish with whipped cream and a pineapple topping, so all in all, this was exactly the kind of thing you would get to cheer yourself up. Sometimes you need the opposite of sweet and cold to lift your spirits back up. You need spicy and hot. What would you get on a day like that? Nachos with extra hot sauce? Fried jalapenos? Mexican takeout? Or would you rather go for a batch of stuffed bell peppers a dollar each? The mentality of the average American back then really took to these bad boys, and they were filled with a mix of ground meat to make them even more of a treat. All in all, 
If you wanted something to put the pep back in your step and light a fire under you, you would get these cheap bell peppers that gave you enough steam to carry out the rest of your day. 1971 saw a cultural reset in the fast food scene with the introduction of the Quarter Pounder. Something that consists of half our diet today first touched restaurants back then, and it was a larger-than-average beef patty served with tomato, pickles, onions, and their special ketchup. Sure, that description is not so different from the one we have today, but back then, they were making the best ones the brand had ever seen since they were really trying to establish it as one of their top products just like the Big Mac meal. It became a very popular family meal as a result, and it was the ringleader of the fast food boom that the 70s went through. With three cans of chicken of the sea tuna, you had affordability and variety all in one. An easy to handle and recognizable mermaid based packaging with three distinct flavors all for a dollar. You had chunky, light and white albacore tuna. Chicken of the sea tuna was known for being flaky but soft, and it was a really reliable option for your average Thousand Island dressing or tuna salad. Casseroles with tuna stuffings would also often go for this brand over all others. And one of its trademark qualities, besides the price, was that it was really easy to prepare and use in daily cooking, which is exactly the image they were going for. And that is all you could eat if you had a dollar and a dream back in the 70s. Like, subscribe, and let's keep those happy memories alive.